Um, my name is Allison Scalberg. I'm with Consolidated Planning Group. Uh, uh, we're excited today uh, to bring to you this event on uh, the Social Security Administration and kind of all the things that you need to know. Um, Consolidated Planning Group is a holistic financial planning firm for special needs families. And when it comes to special needs planning, um, one of the things that we hear a lot is um, what about SSI and Medicaid and what about SSDI and Medicare? And it's so confusing and it's so complicated or I never qualified before and now all of a sudden my child is turning 18 and I hear that I might qualify. So um, today we're, um, we're really excited to partner with Barbara Bush today. Um, she is a national social security advisor. She's actually certified and um, she's a very knowledgeable lady and she's gonna talk to us about these topics today. Um, you guys are in a mute um, in a mute status um, for this presentation, and we do that deliberately um, for everybody to be able to hear and and limit background noise. Um, we do want to answer your questions, um, and we know that this is a confusing topic, um, but there is a chat box. So as we're going through the presentation today, if you're having questions, I'm going to be monitoring that chat box, and um, I'll be bringing those questions to Barbara. Um, so just um, don't be shy, put your questions in there. And again, if you don't want everybody to know it's your question and you wanna um, just send that to me privately, then I'll certainly um, get that question answered for you. Um, so with consolidated planning, when it comes to special needs planning, the areas of, um, that we're able to help you with are protection planning, lifetime care, transition planning, able accounts, advocacy. These are a lot of buzzwords that we hear over and over and over again. But I think that some of the unique differences that we bring to the table is we're really able to work with you um, with the advisors that you've already worked with before, um, with the planning that you've already done in place. But what we do is we do a lot of listening um, about really what's important to you. What are the unique, um, you know, the unique needs of your family and of your situation and your child with special needs? And what does the future look like? What are we hopeful? What are we certain about? What are we hopefully optimistic about? And, um, you know, and as a result of those things, what do we need to do going forward? And, and I think that we can, you know, really do a good job of providing information on that. So without any further ado, Barbara, I'm going to turn everything over to you. And um, thank you so much for being here today. And we're just, we're so excited to hear what you have to say. Well, thank you. And thank you everyone for being here. Um, so I am Barbara Bush. I'm the founder of Solutions for Special Needs Families. I have worked in the industry for about 10 years. Um, eight of them with, I was the director of admissions at Marbridge Foundation and then started my own business in 2018 because I decided I wanted to help individuals navigate through this complex issue. So let's see. Okay. So what is supplemental security income? Um, it is a federal income supplement program funded by general tax revenue, not social security taxes. So this, and it is designed to help the aged, blind, or disabled who have little or no income, and it provides cash to meet the basic needs for food, clothing, and shelter. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, who is eligible for SSI? Allison, can you go back? I'm having trouble. Thank you. So you must meet the Social Security's definition of disability. And they have pages and pages and pages of their disabilities that they will consider and what criteria you have to meet. So you, the disability must have occurred before the age of 22. You must you meet the income and asset limits. 
you must be a U.S. citizen and a resident of the U.S., must file for other benefits, and must not able to earn a substantial gainful activity. Social Security thinks if you make $1,260 a month, that that's a substantial gainful activity and therefore they don't consider you disabled because on that amount, they think you could support yourself, which we all know, <laughs> you know, even their benefit of 783, you can't support yourself. So how, how does Social Security define disability? Well, there's a very strict definition of disability that relates to your ability to perform work and the projected length of your disability. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you must submit medical records, a current not an old one, but a current psychological evaluation, school records, work records, household arrangements, and medicine taken to prove your disability is severe enough to keep you from working. So if you, like I said, have a job and you're making uh, 1100, 1200 a month, you're not gonna qualify for SSI. So where do you start the process? It just went away. Okay. <laughs> so your child is 18 and now deemed an adult. If you file for SSI, only the young adult's income is counted. Whereas if you file before they're 18, the parent's income and assets are considered. So you can create an online social security account for your young adult and file SSI online. Now, most of my clients since COVID-19 have had difficulty and really have not been able to excuse me, create an online account. So your other options would be, you can file a paper application or you can call the social security and start the process by giving them the information. Um, if you file, a, yes. Can you just chat for a minute? Cause I, 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 wanna, I wanna talk about this for a minute and this cause this is an important conversation. And what we see often is um, most of the families that we work with, they are not, they don't qualify. Their child doesn't qualify for anything. Thankfully, they make too much money. Thank, you know, it's a blessing and a curse. And so even though your child is, you know, severely disabled, clearly disabled, there's no question about this. Um, you basically don't qualify for SSI and Medicaid um, because, because you simply, um, you make too much, you have too many assets. Right. So one of the things that I want to make clear is that that it is a means based program. So um, and, and Barbara hit on this is that once the child turns 18, even though the child still lives with you and you still, you know, you know, have a deduction for them on your taxes, it's based off of their income and their assets at the time. So there's some magic numbers, and I know Barbara is going to talk about that. But what we see is because we went for 18 years and you never qualified for anything, people don't necessarily know that they should go back to this application process when the child turns 18. So she's talking about applying online. She's talking about the paper application. And when can you do this? It does not have to happen after the child's 18th birthday. It's the month that the child turns 18. And the Social Security Administration seems to be backed up. 
So if you know that you're, obviously you know when your child's turning 18, if they're turning 18 in January, then maybe you wanna call now and go ahead and get your appointment scheduled because it's probably gonna be eight to 10 weeks before you get an appointment anyway. So t try to go ahead and get your, your, your appointment scheduled for January 2nd. The sooner you do it, if you wait till the month that they, they turn 18, it could be two or three months before you actually get an appointment to speak to somebody. So I just, I just wanted to share that and I wanted to bring for the, for the folks that have never qualified for anything, um, kind of understanding how that works because we see that as a common um, thing that people don't understand how, how it works. So I'm turning it back over to you. Okay. Um, thank you, Allison, for that. Um, the other thing is if your child had qualified for SSI prior to 18, when they turn 18, you have to re-qualify because Social Security has different criteria for a, someone under 18 and then somebody over 18. Um, so here again, I'm talking about how you can go online and create that account. Because you, if you can, then you can file all the documentation online, but you still have to mail in and do it certified uh, to make sure that they did get it. But you still have to mail in the uh, information, the back, the supporting documents. So this again is, you know, if you get online, you choose apply for disability benefits. You can then complete the application and submit the, you can complete the information and submit the application. Once submitted, an agent from the social security will contact you to confirm the information and ask some further questions. So as soon as you're approved for SSI, you immediately get Medicaid. Um, and to remain eligible for Medicaid, uh, the individual must not exceed the resource limit of $2,000 and be receiving at least $1 from SSI. So they will, I'm gonna go into how you might not get the full $783. So when you're approved, I don't know why it's doing this. Allison, can you help me? Yeah, I'm, I'm, we're having a little technical difficulty with the slides. Just bear with us for just one second. I apologize for that. There we go. Thank you. So once you're approved, usually the Social Security um, Administration will appoint a representative payee. And the representative payee, what they're going to ask is, can your young adult manage their financial needs? Do they, do they have a checking account? Can they balance their checking account? Do they understand money? Uh, would they understand all the things you have to, what money can be spent on and how to report that? If not, the parent or guardian will be appointed as the representative payee. Next, you will set up a checking account for 
the social security benefit and it'll be the parent as representative payee for the child to accept the SSI benefit. Remember as the representative payee, you, you're, you must <laughs> uh, know the rules on how the money can be spent and know the rules if the recipient works. I'll, yeah. The representative payee and the earned income. So if your child can work and is, you must report the recipient's gross earnings by the 10th of the following month. So they worked in October, you get the pay stubs and submit those to Social Security prior to yesterday. <laughs> um, if you do not submit the gross monthly uh, wages and the recipient is overpaid and loses benefits, the representative payee is personally liable to pay back the amount. Now this normally does not happen, but it can. So if there's an overpayment, they will take it out of the SSI benefit. But you can ask Social Security to only take 10% of the social of the over 10 percent of the overpayment from the SSI benefit. So, you know, making sure you're keeping as much as you can. Okay, so SSI puts income into one of two categories. You have unearned income or earned income. So I'm gonna start backwards here. Earned income is wages, so if they're working, what they make, or food and shelter in lieu of wages. And we're gonna go on to that in the next couple slides. Unearned income is Title II cash benefits. So if your child's disabled and they're working, they can work for a year and a half and have enough work credits to begin getting SSDI on their own work record. They also, if the parent retires or dies, they're entitled to half of the parent's social security amount, and if they die, they're uh, eligible for 75%. So this is something, you know, if you're doing future planning to consider this income stream. Um, unearned income is also it, if they get VA benefits, interest on a checking account, an allowance, assets or gifts, or winnings. So if they win the lottery, you probably aren't going to have be able to qualify for SSI. So SSI reduction for earned income. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're going to just make up some numbers. So your child has made five hundred and eighty five dollars in the month and that's gross income. So Social Security says you get an earned income exclusion and an unearned income exclusion. Those total $85 and Social Security lets you keep $85. So you subtract that, you divide that amount, so that amount would be $500, $250 is countable earned income that would be subtracted from your the Social Security benefit. OK, 
Can you help me go to the next slide, Allison? Okay. So unearned income. So we're going to say this is off their own work record because it's a small amount. So they make, they get $220 from social security disability insurance. Now in this case, there's a general income exclusion of $20. So you get to keep $20 of that amount and then your countable earned income is $200. Next slide. So further things that can reduce your a benefit is in-kind support and maintenance. Now this sounds kind of strange, but you have to charge your child for room and board. Because if someone else was living there, you would probably charge them for to live there and you know the food they eat. <clears throat> so, so Social Security considers this wages, basically, if you're not. So $783 would be the maximum amount you could get and they subtract one third of that amount. So $261. And so the adjusted SSI benefit is only $522. Next slide. I'm not able to make the slides go further. So now we're gonna put all of it together. Let me chat about this for a second because this is one of the biggest things. So. So the bottom line is, is like right now, um, the the monthly amount is 783 a month. Uh, next year for 2021, it's going to go to 794 a month. So there's, you know, there's a lot of discussion about rent, mm -hmm. like charging rent versus charging their fair share. So I'd like to can can we chat about that for a second? Because um, what we know is that if you're charge so in order to get the 783 a month to Barbara's point. Um, the individual either needs to be paying their fair share or they need to be paying rent. And, and so if you advise the Social Security Administration of this, then, then you'll get your benefit raised from the 500, 500 figure to the 783 a month. But there's a couple of things to understand between fair share versus rent, and there's a lot of confusion with this. So if you're charging your child rent, deliberately so that they can get their SSI full benefit, which is what most parents do, then technically from an IRS perspective, then you should be deducting this on your taxes, the rent. Okay. So that's one thing. So you could technically get in trouble if you're charging your child rent and not, you know, recording that on your taxes, that could be problematic for you in the future. And we don't provide tax advice, but we just want you to know and be aware of that. And you should talk to your uh, your tax advisor about that. But where you don't have to record this on your taxes is if you're paying, if the child is paying their fair share. So the question is, is are your expenses low enough or do you have a large enough family that the, that the individual can pay their fair share? So where this is a good example is where families that don't have a mortgage anymore, okay? Their house is paid off. So basically your fair, sh the, the fair share is the share of the utilities um, and a share of the food cost. So if there are five people in the house, fair share is divided by five, and that's the amount that the person would need to pay. So as long as that amount is less than the 783 a month and they can afford to pay that, then you can show that. So anyway, I just wanted to share that and then I give it back to you, Barbara, but because I have to tell you that we have conversations about this, this very topic every single day. So um, can you talk a little bit more about that? I'm going to go into that in all the slides. Um, the one thing I will throw out there, um, since you brought this up, is uh, one of my clients was a um, tax accountant, and his son was paying rent, and he said, the rent that I'm receiving, there's so many offsets of expenses for that child 
and for the food that he said, you know, he wasn't going to pay taxes doesn't mean somebody else might not. So we're going to go into this and then we're going to really go into rent. So here you have the unearned income of 200. You have the earned income of 585. You subtract 85 from the 585. You divide that number in two. So your countable earned income is 250 for earned income and the countable unearned income is 200. So here you've got the maximum federal benefit rate of $783. They're going to subtract 261 if your child's not paying their fair share. And then they will subtract 450 for the adjusted total, total countable income. And so your child would end up receiving $72 from Social Security, which, you know, is a reduced amount, but they do keep Medicaid. And a lot of times Medicaid is what the parents need. Can you forward me, Allison? Okay, so how to determine what is in-kind support? So the example assumes that the person is living at home with mom and dad. The mortgage is $1,200 a month. The average bills are $300 for electricity, $100 for water and sewer, and $800 for food. The total monthly expenses are $2,400. Because there's three people living in the household, the individual's fair share of expenses is $800 a month. Next slide. So the way to overcome this, because 800 is more than their amount, their benefit. So when you, you can open an ABLE account because the ABLE account is specifically to pay for um, housing and for food. Whereas a special needs trust is not, cannot pay for house, food and housing. Not to say it might not, but legally it's not supposed to. So when you're, the bank receives the SSI check, so the representative payee will send $500 to the individual's parents for room and board. The trustee of the special needs trust or the individual's parents contribute at least $300 a month into the ABLE account. The ABLE trust administrator withdraws $300 from the ABLE account as a qualified disability expenditure and sends a check or electronic funds to mom and dad for the monthly rent. So the ABLE account, once money is put in there, it is a complete transfer. It is now your child's money and the child is the one that has to pay the rent. So money from SSI is their money Money in the ABLE account is there. Yeah, go ahead. Um, one of the things I just wanted, I wanted to chime in on the special needs trust and the ABLE account, because these are other buzzwords that we all hear in the special needs community over and over and over again. And we think that we need a special needs trust or we think that we need an ABLE account. We talk about these things and you may or may not need a, a special needs trust and or an ABLE account. So that magic number that she talked about earlier, the $2,000 in assets, okay? So you can pay rent. The whole point of SSI is to pay for food and shelter. So you can pay uh, for rent or mortgage payments out of a regular checking account. So if your SSI um, check goes into a, the, the, the individual's checking account, and as long as that 
account balance stays below $2,000, you can pay uh, rent and mortgage payments out of that checking account. When an ABLE account and a special needs trust come into play is when we're planning for the future of this individual that might have care needs that are far obviously greater than $783 a month, the only two places that you can have money that is not going to be counted against you for the social SSI purposes is the ABLE account and the special needs trust. And so the next question is, do I need an ABLE account or do I need a special needs trust? And, and to Barbara's point, is the special needs trust, when you're getting SSI, that special needs trust, you can't pay rent and mortgage payments out of the special needs trust. So that is why, in that example, why you might need the ABLE account, why you might need both. So I just wanted to share that a minute in case we had anybody that's joined us today that hasn't really heard that. It starts getting pretty complicated and convoluted. So I just wanted to, to bring you guys in on that. Um, the other thing with um, the difference in a special needs trust and an ABLE account, special needs trust, you can name the beneficiaries. You can name who is uh, the contingent, who is would get the money left in the special needs trust when that child is gone. The ABLE account is considered, it's like a Medicaid payback. So if Medicaid has spent anything on your child, they get paid first. So they will take money out of the ABLE account to pay themselves. And then if there's anything left, it can go to whoever you've designated. So and that in the event of, of the, the death of the disabled individual. So there, so, so there's a Medicaid payback. And so we hear about this, it's called a clawback a drawback, a Medicaid payback are some of the terms that we hear and they're all the same thing. So we do have a Medicaid payback and an ABLE account. And we also have a, a required Medicaid payback and a first party special needs trust. So a first party special needs trust is this is money that the individual has earned themselves. This could be a lawsuit um, winnings it's their money as opposed to somebody else's money or proceeds from life insurance. So there's also a Medicaid payback for a first party special needs trust, but not all people have or need a first party special needs trust that just depends if, you know, you know, where and how you are getting money from. And the other thing is if you're divorced and your husband or wife or is paying child support. If they continue to pay child support to you for the benefit of your child, that's income and probably you're going to be disqualified from SSI. So you need, once they turn 18, that child support needs to go into a first party special needs trust. So we're not, I'm I do want to talk about this because this is something that also comes up all the time and it sneaks up on people because they didn't know that they needed this to go to a special needs trust because remember, it never mattered before. Your child never got SSI before. You never had to worry about it. You're just getting, you know, child support and a lot of people negotiated in their divorce if they had a child that was going to need care for the rest of their life that the child support would continue post 18. So um, the sooner you can get this taken care of, ideally there could be an agreement you can get this you know, signed off on. Um, but I want to explain, I want to, I want to be you know, um, clear that you, this does need to already be an agreement signed off on a judge, by a judge or in a court order that the child support is directed to a first party special needs trust. Um, we did have somebody on one of our calls a couple of weeks ago that said, hey, it's no big deal, cool. I got a special, a first party special needs trust. I didn't even have to call my attorney. I just logged into the child support system in the state of Texas and I simply updated once I got my special needs trust, I opened a, um, a first party special needs trust checking account and all I did was log into the state of Texas child support system and I updated my checking account of where child support is going to my special needs trust checking account. And that sounds fabulous and it was great that they bypassed everything, but again, but because there wasn't a court order, um, 
it, it could all go to heck in a handbasket and it probably will. So again, you need an agreement, you need a court order, and yes, you can do that, but it's not going to work. Um, so because there's laws, there's something specifically in the palms for the Social Security Administration that prevents that. So I, I just wanted to put that out there um, and it's, it's just really important. So if you're in a, going through a divorce, in the middle of a divorce, it is something that's very important that you talk about getting that child support directed to a first party special needs trust because it is simply income. The child will turn 18 and they will not qualify or they will disqualify for SSI. It's, it's as simple as that and it's super important. Yep, it is. Okay, quickly on the ABLE account. So this is my little matrix because it is confusing. And in this example, I tell parents, you're gonna be opening another checking account where the rent will be paid simply because you have to prove all these payments are coming out of SSI checking and the ABLE account and where is it going? Well, if it's going into your personal checking account, you need to give the social security a copy of your personal checking account. Most people don't like that, want to be a little more private. It's very easy to open a checking account nowadays. So, all right, so we have this special needs child. They're in the middle in the square box they're receiving the SSI benefit of 783. So the family either is putting money into a special needs trust or into the ABLE account. The administrator of the ABLE account sends $300 each month to that rent account. The SSI checking account sends $500. You're now satisfying that $800 a month rent. Okay, next. So then you ask, well, how is Social Security going to know about the change? So after the payments have occurred for at least two months, the representative payee will mail bank statements from the ABLE account, from the SSI checking account, and for the rent account to, the, to your local Social Security Administration office. The current in-kind support and maintenance charge should be dismissed, and two months later, the SSI recipient should receive the full $783. But be sure the following is done. There must be two separate accounts, the ABLE account and social SSI payment account. The SSI payment cannot be placed in the ABLE account. So that's why you have to have two separate accounts. Now in the ABLE, if your child works, they can put their money into that so the rule on the ABLE account is you can only put in $15,000 a year. So if your child's working, they can put their earnings into that ABLE account. It will still be considered against the SSI amount, but they can have more than $15,000 a year into that. Okay, next slide. So what happens when the parent, you, will retire or pass away? So when a parent applies to receive their own Social Security benefits, the disabled adult child, which is commonly called a DAC, um, is entitled to receive 50% of the parent's benefit. Now the child must be deemed disabled to receive this amount. 24 months later, after receiving the Title II benefits, the disabled adult child will be eligible for Medicare. So they will have Medicaid and Medicare. And when a parent passes away, 
the disabled adult child is entitled to 75% of the deceased parent's social security benefit. Now this does not take away from your benefit. You still get the same amount. Do you have something that's Allison? Yeah, I just wanna, I wanted to say, because this was actually something that we had in the chat, bo chat box and something that we learned um, recently and confirmed with the administration is that so correct on the 50% correct on the 75% upon death but it is based off of your full retirement age mm -hmm. okay so here's the deal yes. if you turn your so, so say you're eligible to turn social security on at age 62 and you turn it on at age 62 well it's going to be based off of age 62 and 50% of that number if your full retirement age is age 67 um, and you turn it on at age 67, it's going to be 50% of that number, 75% of that number. But what we get all the time is, well, what if I wait until age 70? Will that increase the benefit for my child? And the answer is no. It will increase your benefit, but it will not increase the benefit for the child. The child's um, benefit would be the 50% of age 67. So I wanted to clarify that because that may make a difference on how you choose and when you choose to turn it on. The other thing that I wanted to say that we have seen as an issue, and it is an issue, okay? It's even an issue for sometimes the people that even work at the Social Security Administration, is the confusion of SSI and Social Security. So people throw around all the time, my child gets social security, when the reality is, is their child does not get social security, their child gets SSI. So again, SSI is the means-based program, social security, also known as social security disability, and also known as uh, of SSDI. So here's three names I just threw at you, and they're all known as the same thing as social security disability. The deal is, is that is not a means-based program that is um it's based off of work work credits so and that's where she's getting at on this um dis disabled adult child so i wanted to, to to give you that information because the bottom line is is if you're applying for social security for ssi for the first time what happens is you apply for ssi and you apply for social security at the same time but nobody explains this to you and then the very first letter that you get in the mail is that you're denied, that your child is denied and you're very angry. But what happens is the social security letter, SSDI letter is what comes first. And they are denied because they don't have enough work credits. It's not a means-based program. SSI is a means-based program. It would be nice if the letters come at the same time, but they don't. So the social security denial letter comes first. You think you're completely denied for everything. You're not. And then the SSI letter comes later. So I just wanted to clarify that because there's so much confusion with the way they throw these names around. Yes. Um, and the other little name that comes up that's confusing is RSDI, Retirement Survivor Disability Insurance. So that would be the benefit, that would be the name of the benefit that they're getting from the parent. Um, SSDI is on their own work record. So, or if you get disabled, you get SSDI on your own work record. Okay, do you wanna go to the next slide? So if a parent is on SSDI, then, and if, they have an adult child. You want to go back? <laughs> we'll work through the technology. Yeah, we're working on it. Sorry about that. It's challenging. Okay. So if you as an adult are receiving SSDI and your child is disabled, they will receive half of that income. This begins when the child is diagnosed with a disability and may continue through the child's lifetime. 
again, when that child turns 18, if this was occurring prior to 18 for the child, they have to reapply just to prove that they're disabled again once they're 18. So, but depending on the amount the child is receiving from RSDI, the child may also qualify for SSI and Medicaid. They also may not. So if the SSDI or the RSDI is more than $783, and then you try to apply for Medicaid and SSI, you won't get it. So, you know, it just, it's the way life happens. Um, had a client that their, her husband died when the child was 13. The child was disabled. They got, the child got 75% of that. And when it came time for SSI and Medicaid, well, they said, you make too much. You can't get that. Well, she wanted her child, her daughter to be, um, she had signed her up for the, all the Medicaid waivers. Well, they want you to be eligible for Medicaid. So we, there are workarounds, but, you know, life can throw us all curveballs. Next slide. So, yes, I just went over this slide. I guess we can go on to the next. So Medicaid doesn't always talk clearly to S Social Security. So if you start getting the SSDI or RSDI and it's more than $783 and less than 1,061, Medicaid may, not will, notify you that the person is receiving too much income and is no longer qualified for Medicaid. At that point, you have a certain amount of time to file the H1200EZ form. You must attach the disabled adult child provision from the Social Security Palms um, to this application. But do not file the uh, form unless Medicaid notifies you that um, they're going to take away your Medicaid. Next slide. So this is strictly from, and I call it POMS, it's called the Social Security Administration Policy and Operations Manual. And in that, they give definitions and guidelines for how everything, how they want everything to work. So this is basically a non-legalese term saying that if prior to a parent retiring, if you were eligible for SSI and Medicaid, you will still be qualified for Medicaid. You may not get the benefit from SSI, but you will retain the Medicaid. And that's important with a lot, you know, a lot of families want that dual coverage of Medicaid and Medicare. Okay, next slide. So the big question is, how do you manage all that? All the rules, all the, you know, everything going on. You're trying to keep the family together, possibly work and keep, you know, keep up with your other kids and the special, your, your disabled child. They demand a lot. And now you have to learn <laughs> social security rules. And so I like the, you know, where you're spinning the plates. How many plates can you spin at one time without something being dropped? Next slide. So if you're feeling overwhelmed navigating through the SSI application process, it's time to ask for help. You can reach out to disability benefit specialist or disability attorneys. But either way, you also need to 
be proactive with whoever you hire to help you because you know if yeah i've seen a lot of problems with disability attorneys that um don't instruct their client with enough information to not be denied i'll just try to say it politically correct there okay i'm not gonna say it politically correct <laughs> okay <laughs> i'm just gonna be real with this so um I, I, I think what, what we have to talk about here, there's a lot of attorneys that are willing to sign up to take your money, okay, and to take a percentage of your back pay, and they're, they're signed on to your case, and it's like beating your head against the wall to get them off of your case, and a lot of us, um, and there's a lot of great attorneys, so I don't want, I'm not stepping on any toes out here of any, you know, any attorneys that might be on, on here today, there's a lot of great ones. Um, but there are also a lot of attorney mills that claim themselves as the social security specialist helper and they've got they're running a lot of people through there like um, I, 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 you know, I'm a mom and I've done this with my adult special needs child we've gone through all of this and we, we hired a bad one. Okay, you know, so um, where I was like starting to even wonder if the person even really existed. Okay, and and they were not helpful at all, but they were very much in line to get money um, when they did nothing for it. So, so there's some differences. Um, so there's a couple of things that I want to say. So yes, you can do this on your own. Okay, so you can, you can apply on your own, and she provided information in the application and setting up an online account. Sometimes situations are difficult because somebody's already retired. A parent is already disabled. There's divorce situations. There's other weird moving parts that make this thing complicated. And that for sure is when I would say I would bring in a professional. So here's the cool thing about Barbara. And Barbara and I, um, we know each other professionally. She's not in my business. I'm not in hers. But we like to send referrals to Barbara because Barbara is not an attorney and she doesn't have her hand in your pocket every time Social Security is paying you. She charges a flat fee. So basically, if this is not your forte and you don't want to do this and you want somebody that's specialized to do this to help you through the process so you can get approved sooner versus later, then you can pay one one flat fee to Barbara and she runs point on all of this and does all of the headache work. Okay. So you can do it yourself. You can hire an attorney, make sure you hire a good one and you can hire like an advocate in, in Barbara and charge up and who charges a flat fee. Um, some of the things that I want to talk about, and I know we're coming to the end of this is there's a couple of things that you should be aware of. And, and I like to tell our families to have your ducks in a row. Okay. Um, as you're coming down the bend and you're going to be applying for SSI, this is where you have a list of the, the names of the diagnosis, the years diagnosed, uh, the, the list, the names, address, and phone numbers of the physicians that treat your child and what they treat them for, how to contact them. Um, this is a little over the top, but I called my primary care physician because the, 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 they're going to get the records of your primary care physician. And what we have found is oftentimes um, there's dictation services and other things for medical records. Sometimes the medical records are wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so before you have the Social Security Administration go get the medical records of your child, you want to make sure that your child's diagnoses are properly documented in their medical records and to the degree of the disability is kind of all in there. So I do suggest partnering with your primary care physician to just take a look at that. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is that if you're going to do this yourself, start yourself a Word document for the Social Security Administration. Make a note of who you talk to, when you talk to them, what they told you, what you agreed to, what you send them. And when you send them stuff, you can send them by fax right now. The most effective way right now because of COVID to send documents into the Social Security Administration is by fax. They're getting them faster by fax than they are um, by mail because the limited crew that's actually in, in the office. Um, but if you are going to send them by mail, it helps to send them certified mail where you have proof that they actually signed for it because you'd be surprised 
how you could send documents, the same documents four times, and they actually say they never get them. <laughs> so and and I've had the t time where I sent it certified mail. I had that it was signed for what date it arrived, and they said no, we've never received anything. Right. So, so those are all things that are just good best practices. So first, I, the two other things that I want you to know about is the blue book and the red book. And then also there are some presumptive disabilities that's like a slam dunk, it's like automatically, like so if a, a, if a person has Down syndrome, um, th that is an automatic, they're gonna qualify for SSI. Um, they're, they're, and they're, I think there's like 30 impairments, right? Mm -hmm. for that are like automatic that they're gonna qualify. So there is the blue book and then there's the red book. So the social security blue book is like an impairment guide. So this is where you could look by neurology or cardiology or any of the other specialties. And it basically, if your child has autism, it is going to show you what do you have to prove to the administration to prove that your child is disabled. So downloading the social security blue book before you go down this highway and looking up your child's impairments are a good idea. And then the, the social security red book um, is going to talk about working while getting benefits and how working affects getting benefits and what you can and can't do. And it's a whole, that's a whole other, we could have a whole other two hour Zoom meeting on that. So anyway, um, it is complicated. You're not alone. We've got a few questions in the chat box that I want to um, I want to just hit on. I know there's been a lot of conversation in the chat. Um, we did talk about the age 67 versus age 70. Um, and yes, this has been recorded and you will get a copy of this presentation today. Let's see. I, I'm just trying to go through here and the highlights. Um, does anybody want to talk about, um, does filing for guardianship of your child affect any of this? And, and basically, no, um, because you'll just be the representative payee. I mean, well, um, the, other, the other thing is, you have to have current letters of guardianship. In Texas, when they approve you to be a legal guardian, it's only good for 16 months. You have to file an annual accounting with the courts and then they, and post a bond, and then they will issue you new letters of guardianship. And not everybody has or needs guardianship. And just because you have a special needs child doesn't mean that you need guardianship. There are a lot of other things. We do meetings about this. There's supported decision-making. Uh, there's a power of attorney and a healthcare power of attorney. So. Um, I mean, clearly there are some many examples where there is definitively a need for guardianship, but that is not always the case. And that isn't, it isn't, you don't have to have guardianship in, in, um, to be a representative payee if that's what, um, I'm just looking at some of the questions. Um, the, so it's again, age 18. So if they have Down syndrome and there's a whole list of other impairments that a person can have that's an automatic qualification. But um, so the bottom line is, is for qualifying for SSI. And this is a frustrating thing for many people is like their child is clearly disabled. And they, again, they qualify for nothing because it's a means based program. So here's the deal. If you're married, you can have $3,000, one house, and one car. So if you have less than $3,000 in your name, you only have one car and one house, and your child has a disability, then you may qualify for SSI prior to them turning 18. If you're not married, the magic number is $2,000, one house and one car. The moment that you have more than one house, the moment that you have more than one car, it's over they don't qualify. So so then the next time that, that, that there is an eligibility is when they turn 18 and it's based off of their income, not yours. Um, Barbara, do you wanna talk about um, the Texas waiver programs for SSI, RSDI, and um, afraid of losing a waiver if receiving RSDI? Sure. So, once you get to the Medicaid waivers, um, I'm going. I'm going to go back a little bit. 
The only Medicaid waiver that looks at income is Texas Home Living. And that looks at income and that looks at, you have to have Medicaid at that time. The other, wa other waivers are not, they don't consider the income. So you have to have Medicaid, but your SSI or your SSDI or your RSDI is usually paid to the provider. It depends on how you set it up. Every, you know, there's a lot of different options there, but that's not going to disqualify you from receiving your, that benefit. Um, and then, okay, I think I think that we've hit um, most of the questions. If there's any more um, questions, please put them in the chat box because we're um, going to wrap up. Um, one of the things that we've heard over and over is the magic age of 22. What is this magic age of 22 that we keep hearing about? And this is when the disability needed to start before. So if your child's disability started prior to age 22, that is what is going to allow them to be a DAC, the disabled adult child under the parent's record, okay? So then I have people with the panic face of, I didn't know this and we didn't do it and he's 25 now, now what? So yeah. the good news is, is you can still apply because as long as you can prove that the disability started prior to age 22, then that's good. Now they're not gonna go back all those years and everything like that, but you just need to be able to prove that the that the disability started prior to age 22. So there's a few things that can affect this too. So so again, um, so a, a child that's disabled may never have the work quarters. Okay, so being under a disabled adult child under a parent's record, basically they're piggybacking on your quarters and they have quarters now. And so even if the parent dies, they're still under the parent's record. But where this gets all messed up, and this is where the red book, red book comes in, is if they go to work and they lose benefits or they fall off the, the eligibility of the disabled adult child, that's one thing that messes it up. And another thing that messes it up is if they get married, okay? Mm -hmm. So just because a person has a disability doesn't mean that they can't get married. We see many, many people with disabilities that are married. So if a child is under um, a disabled, uh, they're a disabled adult child under the parent's record and they get married, all bets are off. Now they're, now they're on their own or their spouses. And so typically, of course, the work record of the spouse is much lower, much smaller. I mean, it can really mess up a lot of things. So you just need to be aware of that. If you're in a situation where your child may get married in the future or something like that, you need to um, really educate yourself and spend some time and thinking about how does this impact? Do I care about this? What if I lose this? What, you know, what if not? Because once it's done, it's done. So um, I just wanted to share that. Let me just see if I have any other. Um, I, I did have an interesting one that I wanted to um, share here. Uh, it says, I lost it. Hang on. It said something about a visa card that they're getting a visa card. They didn't know about the checking account. Are you familiar with that, Barbara? I'm sorry. What was that again? I was reading something from the chat. <laughs> says, I'm a representative payee for my daughter. Uh, SS, SSI sent a visa card for the monthly uh, SSI deposit. There was never a mention of a checking account for the deposit, depositing her monthly benefits. I didn't know there was any other way. Based on the examples given so far, we are a typical special needs family with a daughter who's recently turned 18. So I don't know why we have a different method of receiving payments. So Barbara, are you familiar with the debit card or a visa card that they're sending out? I, I actually haven't heard of this. I have, okay. but it's usually before they've got that checking account open. So once you get the checking account open, you can call Social Security and give them the all the routing number and all the information. Now I just saw a uh, chat pop up and said, uh, "Will my child receive benefits from both parents when they retire?" And the answer is no. It was be the one that is the highest earner only. So, you know, and you don't get SSI and RSDI. 
I want to bring up one other thing that we see a lot. So a lot of our special needs families, we do see them as um, sometimes, not always, but sometimes as one income household, okay? Mm -hmm. So where, um, you know, one parent is the caregiver and they, and they stay home and the other parent is the wage earner. So sometimes we have this disabled adult child and then we have a spouse that didn't have enough work quarters. So spouses are also entitled to 50% of their, their spouse benefit and then the child is um, entitled to 50% of that parent's benefit. And, and then basically now there is a family household maximum. Okay, mm -hmm. so if you want to Google that. There's a, lot of if, there's a lot of ifs and buts in the household maximum, but there is a household maximum, but you have to be basically the highest wage earner and getting the highest amount of um, SSI to hit that, I mean, uh, retirement benefits to hit that household maximum. But my point is, is in that example where we have one wage earner, one parent that stays home as a caregiver and a special needs child, spouse is entitled to 50%, Okay, so the wage earner is entitled to their social, their their retirement benefits through the Social Security Administration. The spouse is entitled to fifty percent, and the disabled adult child is also entitled to fifty percent. It doesn't it doesn't move down unless you hit that household maximum. So I just wanted to say that because we definitely see that uh, a lot. Okay, so here's what one point I'm going to jump in with. So if I'm going to just pretend it's mom is remarried. And mom's still not a wage earner, but the new husband has a higher income, you know, has a high income, will be receiving a high Social Security benefit. The child can take from the stepfather's benefit. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, so here we have, and, and I think we're going to wrap up after this. Um, yeah. Regarding the ABLE account, so we deposit $300 into the ABLE account and then it gets transferred out to our son. Doesn't that seem redundant? <laughs> oh, yes. Um, you know, I even had a Social Security uh, agent tell me, no, you can't do that. That's wrong. It's, and I said, here it is in the palm. So I had to go to the regional Social Security office and they had to educate the agents. But it does look like I'm gonna throw out their money laundering, but it's not. Because once you put money into that account, you've given it away. You have no right to it. It's now your child's. So yes, you put money in, but he is then paying for his own rent. So, but again, at the same time, so I want to, I, I think with the ABLE accounts, and of course, um, we open ABLE, ABLE accounts for people. I, we have an ABLE account for, for my daughter and to, to each his own. So yes, you can put $15,000 a year into it. And I would only put $15,000 a year into it if I plan on spending $15,000 a year out of it. Okay. Because there's payback. So to me, it's about how you play the game, okay? So here's how I play the game with our ABLE account, okay? So first of all, number one, we don't have more than $2,000 in my daughter's checking account. We never have more than $2,000. She does not go over, we make sure. She pays her rent out of her regular checking account. This is not a special needs trust. We have a special needs trust, but she pays her rent out of her own checking account, and that's fine. Her SSI goes into the checking account, and her rent comes out of the checking account. What we do with our ABLE account is we keep one month's rent in our ABLE account. And this is a backup, okay? And what, why we do this is if one month my daughter falls short in her checking account and doesn't have enough money to pay rent, a normal brain says, oh, no worries, I'm mom, I'll just pay the rent. Well, that's a horrible idea because if I do that, <laughs> That's income for her, and then they're going to reduce her SSI. Whereas if she simply, if she falls short, all we do is go to the ABLE account, we make the distribution for the rent, everything's fine, okay? So so th that's how I play the game, and we've never had to make a distribution. She's never fallen short, but that's our backup plan. So if she does fall short, that we could take one month rent. So if something happens to her, the most money that the Social Security Administration is ever going to get out of her ABLE account is one month rent. Okay, fine. 
<laughs> so so that's how we do it. It's not necessarily right or wrong. That's how we choose to do it. But but where you start running into it is if there's if you're going to have more than two thousand dollars. That's where the able account is definitive. You definitely need to have it. Um, you don't have to rob Peter to pay Paul every month or anything like that. So we don't have any of these going in and going out every single month of the able account like literally we put the money in there one time and thought we might take a distribution out of it for rent one time and we never did so that that's just kind of how it works but it, it, as long as you're as long as you're not going over so I, I hope that um i hope that answers the question i know that we've gone over a little bit um on time today um we've got our contact information on here um on how to get a hold of barbara so if you need help uh, navigating this process and you know you want you want somebody to kind of um, hold your hand walk you through this and and knows the ins and outs Barbara is certified um, you know to, to do this so I just wanted to say that and of course um, you know when it comes to special needs planning all of these things matter so the difference uh, in what what consolidated planning does and other financial planning firms is we're focused in, in, on special needs families. So we understand the nuances. We understand the mistakes that you people accidentally make that causes their children to disqualify for SSI. And all of these things matter. Um, you know, the Medicaid, Medicare, the, you know, the SSI, nobody's getting rich off of SSI and nobody loves Medicaid, but um, it's better than nothing. Right. So it, it helps, you know, if it, it if it helps pay the rent or if it helps pay for food and shelter um, or if it helps offset costs, maybe you have wonderful insurance and you think Medicaid is horrible, but maybe that Medicaid swoops in and pays your high deductible that you have on your wonderful insurance. So, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of things and, and, and it is a pain. And anytime you're dealing with the government or anything like that, um, there are headaches involved, but there are benefits. Um, as a result and just remember that as parents we're not always going to be here so so having these programs in place doing the planning now taking the steps that you need to take to be successful and to preserve the eligibility of these benefits is going to make the difference on whether or not the future care uh, for your child is funded so um so thank you again barbara thank you everyone uh, for for being here with us today and uh, we will send this recording out and the slides and uh, we will also include you on invites on any other um, important topics as it relates to special needs that we have going forward so I hope all of you have a wonderful afternoon okay thank you for being with us bye now bye